Now, we are, as a society, entering a season very similar to the ones which people of previous times have had to pass through. There there are seasons throughout history where the the world itself becomes hostile, or at least the world around us, becomes hostile to the truth of God, to the Word of God, to the presence of God, and ultimately to the people of God in chapter 59 of Isaiah. Now, this is a season Isaiah is talking about where the people of God are about to come under a persecution. There's going to be a, a justice, in a sense, come into the land because they have dealt casually and and in great measure falsely with the truth of God's word that has been conveyed to them. In Isaiah 59 verse 4, he says, this is the social condition. Now, no one calls for justice, nor does any plead for truth. They trust in empty words and they speak lies and they conceive evil and bring forth iniquity. Verse 13, in transgressing and lying against the Lord and departing from our God, speaking oppression and revolt, conceiving and uttering from the heart words of falsehood. Isn't that describe our day? Where lying is abounding. It's, it's unbelievable how people lie now. You, you can't believe almost anything or anybody now when they speak. It's just absolutely astounding. Justice is turned back and righteousness stands afar off. For truth is fallen in the street, and equity cannot enter. So truth fails, and he who departs from evil makes himself a prey. Now, Isaiah is talking about a season that the people of God had to go through in the past where truth became a matter of personal opinion, and absolute truth is rejected. The standard of truth was thrown out. This is the only standard of truth, folks. When you throw the Bible out, you have no more a standard of truth. And as, as Romans... Chapter 1 warns when when any nation deals falsely with this truth and throws it out of their borders, they are given over to a depraved mind and they begin to do everything that the sinful heart of man has always longed to do apart from God's restriction on his or her life and begins to call that which is unholy, holy and begins to call that which is good, evil. And not only that, but it's a time where the culture itself turns against those who believe that God's word is the standard of truth. You, You know that for a fact. Many here today, you know you can't speak the the truth of God's word in the workplace. As soon as you open your mouth and start speaking the standard of God's truth, you're now a divider, you're now a hater, you're now an unwanted person, you're now in in danger in a sense of even losing your employment. People people will walk away from you, you'll be marginalized. You see, Isaiah said it comes to the place in a society where truth falls into the street, truth fails, and people who depart from evil become a prey. In other words, the society itself attacks the people of God who hold to the standard of truth that's in the Word of God. Whoever departs from evil becomes a prey. In other words, the the symbolism is a a lamb in a field and a lion is going to devour it. That's the symbolism of what he's talking about. When When you turn, you find yourself turned against, turned on. You find yourself, in a sense, devoured by the mouths of people around you who have abandoned truth and they're now walking in a, in a lie and they believe their lie is truth. Now, sadly, the Word of God warns that the true gospel will be attacked in the last days, both from without and from within the professing church. And that's a, that's a sad reality. And now, a lot of people don't realize that the gospel has been attacked for a few decades in this nation. We're just waking up and beginning to realize what's been happening. Paul said in 2 Timothy chapter 4 to his young protege Timothy, he said, verse 1, I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead and is appearing in his kingdom. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. In other words, Paul says to Timothy, there's a time where your audience is going to be receptive and there's a time when your audience is going to be hostile to the truth. But be ready. Don't compromise. Keep preaching the truth. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. Now, the interesting thing about turning aside to fables, it doesn't necessarily mean lies. In the Greek, when you look up the word that is the word that's used for fables, it really just means stories, good stories, that, and, and many of these stories have a moral actually to them, and they can actually bring you to tears. I, I could stand here today and tell you a story about maybe my grandmother or my grandfather. It would really move your heart. It might even bring you to tears. But folks, it's not the word of God. It has no power to transform your life. You can memorize my grandmother's story, but it will not transform you. And see that there will be this lust for entertainment in the house of God. And and so the people, many of the people will begin to gather to storytellers, not preachers of the gospel anymore, but people who just tell nice stories. They they make people laugh. They make them feel good about themselves. 
and you walk out and it's just a, it's a momentary pleasure, may I put it that way, but there's no transforming power in it. It is not the Word of God. They will turn their ears away from the Word of God and be turned into places where they're told stories that make them feel good and entertain them. Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 3 and 4, he said to the Corinthian church, But I fear, lest somehow, as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. It's, it's a craftiness, it comes in, it's, a, it's a, a deviating the people of God away from the truths of the Word of God that really matter. He goes on in verse four, he says, for a few comes preaches another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if you receive a different spirit which you have not received, or a different gospel which you have not accepted, you may well put up with it. Paul said, I fear for you, Corinthian church, I fear for you. Being so open to entertainment, that somebody might come and present to you another Jesus and you might say, well, this is really a good idea. I kind of like this Jesus. Does that sound a little bit like some of the doctrine that's gone around in this nation for a couple of decades? That you get to choose the image of Jesus. You get to put the stuff, you know, you get to choose the stuff that goes inside of him. You get to choose his eyes so that, so that you know, what he sees is, is what you want him to see. You get to choose his heart. If, if, if maybe some of the parts of the Bible maybe seem a little too hard, you get to eliminate that and you just put all the soft stuff in there and all the nice words and all the kind words. None of the warnings about sin, not, none of the things that maybe make you uncomfortable. You get to eliminate that and you get to write just good stuff on the heart. And then most importantly of all, you get to put your own voice. So when you pull the string, the voice of Jesus sounds a lot like build a Jesus. But in John chapter 14 and verse 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. So you can't get to the Father through your own Jesus, no matter how hard you try. You can, you can do whatever you want, but there's only one Jesus. And in John chapter 10, verses 29 and 30, Speaking of the security of the true believer, he says, My Father has given them to me as greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. So he speaks of the security that is only found in the hand of God. It's not found in, in anything else in this world, but in the hand of God. This promise that my Father is greater than I, and I put them in my Father's hand. That means you, that means me. But you remember, the scripture says you can't get to the Father's hand, but through the real Jesus. There is no real security in this world if you have in your heart a homemade Jesus. A personal Jesus, a Build-A-Bear Jesus, may I call it that. There's, there's only one Jesus that will survive the coming fire. And you and I are going to go into a season of trial. We have warned you from this pulpit for many, many years. And everything that God put on our hearts years ago, we were warning when the tech boom was making every, so many people millionaires. We were warning when everything was going smoothly. We were warning because God was speaking to us about the days that we were about to experience as a nation. But today, I want to tell you, we are there now. We're not coming to those days. We have entered those days. The world as we know it is launching a wholesale and perhaps a final rebellion against the Lordship of Jesus Christ. The lawlessness is not going to get better. The lawlessness is going to get worse. The deception is going to get deeper. There is going to be a revulsion against Christ and against the people of God that will intensify until the Lord himself comes and returns and intervenes. We are living in the days that the Bible speaks about. And it is only the real Christ that will take you through. I don't want you to find out at some point that the Jesus that you have embraced is not the real Christ. It's a, a Christ of your own making, a Christ of your own heart. Beware of all the, the sermon tasting that's out there on the internet. There's a lot of build the Jesus ministries in this generation. And don't fall prey to them. As Paul said, I'm concerned for you. I'm concerned for those whose, whose Christ is not the Christ yet in the Bible. The, the truth of God is not yet fully formed in you. Don't be led astray by these voices. Don't build your own image of God. God has an image. You cannot alter it. You cannot change it. You cannot make it say what it doesn't say. No matter how hard you try, there is only one Jesus. Now Paul says, I'm going back to the original scripture in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. According to the grace of God, which was given to me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation and another builds on it. So 
Paul says, I've given you the foundation of truth. I've given you the real Jesus. And others, including yourself, are going to start building on this foundation. But he says, let everyone take heed how he builds on it. For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Christ Jesus. Now, if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, or straw, each one's work will become clear for the day will declare it because it will be revealed by fire and the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. Trial will test your Jesus. In the book of Daniel, there was a season where a king called Nebuchadnezzar decided he was going to put an image of himself up and he was going to command the people to bow down to this image and societies get this insane urge in their heart from time to time to say, we're going to redefine the image of man. We're going to redefine the image of God. And it's not going to be a voluntary worship. It's going to be a mandatory worship. Now, he said, at the time when you hear the horn, the flute, the harp, the lyre, the psaltery, the symphony with all kinds of music, you will fall down and worship the golden image that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast immediately into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. Does that sound like our day? Where fallen men, one more time, says, we will tell you what truth is. We will tell you what society should look like. We will tell you what the image of God is and what the image of man is. And you will agree with us and you will bend and you will bow and you will do it our way. And if you don't, it's going to get exceedingly hot for you. There were three young men and they had good jobs. They, they were set over the affairs of the province of Babylon. I mean, that means they, they, they had a good income. They had influence. They had authority. But suddenly, in the midst of all of this, they had to make a choice. Do we bow? to this other image or do we hold to the true image of God and the report came that these three young men refused to bend and they refused to bow they refused to bow to the cultural order of the day they refused to bow to this new form of worship and this new truth that was being conveyed among them and Nebuchadnezzar the king called them in and he said is it true Shadrach Meshach and Abednego you do not serve my gods or worship the golden image which I have set up if that is the case they said, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace and he will deliver us from your hand, O king. But if not, let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the golden image which you have set up. And so the king in his fury commanded the furnace be heated seven times hotter. It's amazing how nothing ever changes, really. It just repeats itself. And we're living in an age where there's an anger against the people of God. And we're very coming soon to the borders of a time when we will be considered an impediment progress of this society. We will be considered expendable enemies, in a sense, of this new order that this world is now embracing, which is in direct rebellion to the Lordship of Christ. And so he bound them up and threw them in the fire, fire so hot that it killed the people that threw them in. And then suddenly, in verse 25, he says to his counselors, look, I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire and they're not hurt. And the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. God. And this is my point. The real Jesus doesn't burn. And nor do those who are in his hand. The flame of fire could not touch them. The scripture says, God sent his messenger and delivered his servants who trusted in him. And they frustrated the king's word and yielded their bodies that they should not serve nor worship any God except their own God. And here we are today. And we each have to make a decision. Who is it that we're going to serve? Now, if you're serving a builder Jesus, then you'll probably will have no problem bowing your knee because your Jesus, when you pull the string, will tell you, it's okay, you can do that. But it's your own voice. It's not the voice of the Son of God. It's your own selective truth. But if you make the choice to serve the living God, you see, the end result of these that didn't bend their knee is that the laws of the land became changed. And it's going to require, in our generation, people of God who will stand up, will speak the truth, will live for the living God and suffer whatever consequences they have to suffer. But the people who bent their knee, there was most likely thousands that bent their knee to this golden image. We don't know the names of even one of them. But the three who didn't, we know their names. And because of the word of God, we know the name of the fourth that walked into the fire with them. The real Jesus that doesn't burn by the grace of Almighty God. God, give us strength. God, give us strength to embrace the whole Word of God, to embrace the truth that's in this book. God, give us strength to enter into a living relationship with the Son of God. Give us strength to admit that we can't save ourselves. We can't get through the coming days in our own strength. We need a living relationship with the Son of God. Give us the strength to admit our need of Him. Give us the hearts to believe that He died on a cross for our sins, went down into the grave for three days and by the power of God was raised from the dead 
as living proof to you and I that if we place our trust in him, we too will live. We will not go down into death. We will not be conquered by anything of this world. The same spirit that raised Christ from the dead will quicken our mortal bodies. That is the promise of the word of God. We will be brought out of death and into life. Give us the courage to confess with our mouths, Jesus Christ, the real Christ as the Lord and Savior of our lives. Give us the, the love, give us the compassion, give us the courage, give us the speech to say to the gods of this world, even if he doesn't deliver me, we will not bow down. He can, and if he chooses to, he will. But we are so determined that we're only going to worship the real God, that even if he doesn't, we choose the furnace over bowing to this golden statue. We choose the furnace over this. And it's a choice, and the strength comes. And thank God, it's always been through people who have turned to God for the courage they need that have changed the whole tenure of their society. When they came out of that fire, because Nebuchadnezzar had seen, he was the king of one, the strongest empire of that time. And when they came out of the fire, he said, there's no God that can deliver like this God. Their God is God. And he made a command that nobody should, should deal falsely or, or with this God or in any way that is untoward towards him. By the grace of Almighty God, the Lord is going to look for people who are willing to stand in this generation. Praise be to God. And by God's grace, we will. By God's grace, we'll triumph. By God's grace, we'll go over the finish line. By God's grace, we will walk with the real Jesus all the days of our life. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. The real Jesus does not promise a life of ease. The real Jesus says, in this world, you shall have tribulation. But also the real Jesus says, but be of good cheer, for I have overcome this world. Be of good cheer. You will have to go through hardship. You will have to go through times that none of us want to go through. But he says, be of good cheer. Matter of fact, in the, in the Gospels, he says, when people speak ill of you, rejoice and be glad in that day. For so their fathers did to the righteous. Hallelujah. So Father, I ask you today, God, in Jesus, God, that you would give us the grace to come out from wherever we are and receive you as Lord and Savior. Give us the strength that we're going to need for the days that are ahead of us. Oh God, please help your people. Please help those that are, they're in a valley of decision. They don't know how deep they want to go in this. They came for freedom. They came for, for comfort. They came for deliverance. And those are good things, but didn't realize there was also a walk and a pathway. Please God, I'm asking you in Jesus' name, help your people. Give us courage. Lord, we are living in a perilous day. Give us courage. Give us the grace to open our Bibles and, and embrace the real Jesus. Help us, Lord, not tr to try to build our own Jesus, but to embrace the real one. Let it begin with a, an admission that we need a Savior, a faith that Christ took our place on the cross, and a confession that as he was raised from the dead, so will we be raised with him and be given a strength that can only come from God. 